So basically, a little bit about us. Um, basically, Active Angling is a, a not-for-profit organisation. Basically, it's just Paul and I um, playing. Um, Paul is the artistic genius. He does all the photo photographing and the putting together the videos. And basically, all I do is write, which is the easy part, I think. Um, so, like I said before, the aim is to encourage people to actually fish more actively. And if you go to our website, you'll see it's, it's all about making it really evocative. It's all about writing stories that involve people and make them want to get out and do it and it's showing them what is actually possible. Um, so again, I'm just sort of reiterating that there by saying that for us it's all about stunning Im imagery and technical articles that actually make people want to go and do it. Um, we're not associated with any tackle manufacturers and that's deliberate because we really want to be impartial and objective and the only exception to that is that I'm a Global, I'm on the global reel testing team for IRT reels, that's spinning reels, um, they also make it fly reels, but it's a totally unpri unpaid um, role, I just get given reels to evaluate and I have to report on them uh, every three months for the, for, the, for, the, for the length of the, or however long it lasts, so I just have to give reports back. Um, if you want to visit our website, it's www.activeanglingnz.com and um, at the moment we've, we've got about People are visiting it from about 120 countries, and probably the biggest two markets that we that we that people are looking at it from would be outside of New Zealand would be the USA and Australia. Um, although we do have a lot of contact coming in from Europe and the UK now, so it's 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 just starting to go off. Um, I just thought I'd be a little bit cheeky, really, because I'm talking to a, a group of fly fly fishermen. So I just really want to get a feel for. Um, how many of you have fished in the salt before and what actually you, what actually you consider as a fly. So, is the, is the, is the fly on the top, top left up there, is that a fly? Yeah. Yeah. What is it? Yeah. Yeah. Do I fly about which one? Yeah. Well done. What about the one on the, on the right? Yeah. What is the one where? fly? What type? Yeah. Gold ribbed hairs here probably? Yeah. Stephen, you have to. Um, what about those two? Copper John on the right. Yeah, and the other ones are. Like give you a clue before, it's another here's ear, isn't it, really? What about those two? John <laughs> Marino <laughs> Are they flies, though? They are flies? Yeah. Very good. Debatable. Yeah, well, they're flies in the definition. Yeah, it's of good, it's good. They're flies in the definition of the regulations, but not in the. Okay, sort of, I just wanted to know fly. whether we had sort of um, Halford in the room or Skews or who we had. So I just sort of, okay, that's, that's <laughs> totally good. I don't have a problem with that. What about those two? Yeah, that's nice. Yeah, okay. yeah, silicon smelts. Because if you say that a silicon smelts a fly, then you by definition pretty much have to give the next one up, don't you really? Even though one's commercial and one's not. So this is where we are. So it's not, in the, in the strictest sense, they're not flies that you probably would have used before. And really, in my world, I think the biggest difference between freshwater and saltwater fishing is actually the flies. I mean, you, could put, you can take your fly gear from what you use at Tongariro and you can walk out here and, and do what you do now. You just have to ups, up, up, upsize a little bit and start to use different patterns, that's all. And as you've seen Stephen tying here, a lot of the stuff is it's actually really sexy stuff. They look like things that you'd find in the sea. You just have to get your mind around what you're dealing with. It's different from fishing in a river. But I tell you now, all of you that do fish in a river have a major advantage on the flats because you're so used to stalking fish. It's what you do on a river. Whereas most people that don't don't fish in the river like you, like this group does, will probably walk on and they just charge on and they won't actually be thinking about what they're doing. Where you all should be dressed for the part, thinking about what you're doing, taking your time, you're used to looking for fish, and you'd be surprised what you find if you just just take your time. So, in my world, what I consider uh, the flats is basically any area of tidal foreshore that has exposed sand, shell beds, mud at low tide. And basically, the thing that's the most difficult thing to get your mind around probably is they're absolutely featureless. So in the winter, it's a terrible, you know, can be a terrible place to be. It gets cold real quick, and there's nowhere to hide. So you get hit with the rain, you get hit with the wind. Same goes in the summer. It 
gets as hot as all hell. So generally that gives you some clue as to the times in the day that you actually need to be on the flats and it's probably not in the middle of the day. So um, the things that you'll see there, there's a wide variety of things that, that fish will feed on and generally you're looking for things like juvenile fish, shrimps and crabs would be the things that, you have, that they're feeding on most around here. And, if, and one thing about saltwater fly fishing, especially around Auckland, is that if you find the habitat, then the target species is going to be holding nearby, especially in summer. Because if, if you walk onto the flats out here on the sand and you can find snapper holes where they've been digging, then dollars to donuts, all they'll do during the day is move out into the deeper water and then when the tide comes back in again, they'll go back onto the flats. Neewa's done a lot of research on this and it's all been quantified and they basically will tell you that snapper, the majority of snapper do not move very far in an estuary once they move in and then they, until they leave later on in the year. Um, and so the other thing that I like to see when I'm fishing out there is I want to see flats that are draining to a defined channel. I want to see a flat area that goes into somewhere deep because the bigger fish will hold in the deeper waters and it, as the tide goes out those big, the little fish that are on the flats will actually get pushed into the deep water and that's where, they'll, that's where the big fish are waiting for them. So it's really quite simple but you just have to start to think about what's happening. So just a few shots here of, of around Auckland just to give you an idea of the of sort of things that we're looking at. I'm a, bit of, I'm a bit different in that I really like to dress the part. So a lot of guys will, like you saw JP, he's just wearing shorts and a t-shirt. Well I'm actually, the absolute other end of the scale, I, I'm actually, I put my game gear on and I'm out there and I've got camo wherever I can and I'm trying to look like the background. And you'd be surprised how close I can get to some of the fish that I see. Um, so these are the um, top two shots, actually all those shots are in the manicow. We're having a bit of a bottom, bottom right, we're having a bit of a play with the double hander. Um, this is a, a car wide workup, and you can see the little fish coming out. Um, these are real close, and um, you, you can touch the fish uh, when it's coming, and you can see them coming. It's quite something if you're, if you're waiting for it. So, the main things that we're after really are. Kawai and snapper and trevally, kingfish at certain times of the year. But most of the time, what you're seeing, um, kawai year round, trevally pretty much year round, <coughs> snapper over the summer and kingfish over the summer is kind of what, what we're dealing with. Um, the other thing that I said before is, as you can see, the flies are different, but that's the pre pretty much the only thing you really have to get your mind around. Um, the trace weights, generally, we're using 7 to 10 kilos, so um, it's a little bit of, a bit of a step up from. Um, from trout fishing for sure. Um, the terrain is quite sandy and muddy and it can be rocky as well so you have to, there's an element of care that you have to take with that but it's, it's not so unusual to what you'd be dealing with on a river. Um, and the only other thing I'm mentioning here is, um, is that you need to have specialised heavier tackle if you're actually fishing for big kingfish and you're near obstructions. Um, we'll talk about that in a minute. Just gives you like, just some pretty pictures of my fly box. If you want to have a look at the flies I'm using, I'll, uh, so you just push those in and you can see what I'm around. So unfortunately I've tied all of these, not Stephen, so <laughs> So nice. most of what most of what you could get or that we would be fishing with would be um, using a six weight rod. So anything you've got that you're fishing in the Tonga area, whether any of it is, six weight's fine. I pretty much, 12 if you, if you know the big kingfish is quite gnarly, but most of the time I'm playing with an eight weight. Because an eight weight on this sort of water where there's no obstructions, you can pretty much land most things on picking. It's only when it gets really tough that, you've, that you need something stronger than that. Um, so most of my work around Auckland is with, is with an aim weight. Um, the other thing that I'd, I'd probably be, be quite keen to see, or that I'm quite keen on is, is disc drag reels with a, with a, a, that have got some degree of stopping power as opposed to your click and your pause that you would use with a trout. Um, you can get away with a, with a click and pull if you're playing for kawai and it's, relative, you know, it's a relatively narrow channel. But if you're going after bigger fish on the flats, probably you need a disc drag. So generally what I'm, I'm using there, I'll circulate that too, I'm just using a, a 
um, a right McGill Sabalos is what I'm using at the moment. But equally, I've also got um, Hardy Ultralight that I use as well. How much now, lines on that? Um, 200 mm -hmm. meters of backing. Um, pretty much all the time. Um, the interesting thing about this is you notice that these reels, um, that's that's not the Hardy reel is not a saltwater reel. Yeah. It's it's a freshwater reel. But um, if you look after this kit, any of the stuff you use on freshwater, you can use in the salt. And it's just a, it's just discipline. So when I go home, I strip all of the line off. I wash it in warm soapy water. It takes about 10 minutes. I clean all the surplus salt off the reel. Dry the line, put it back on, and it's good to go again. And those, you know, this stuff will last you forever if you look after it. So it's just it's just getting in your mind that that's what you've got to do with saltwater gear. Um, <coughs> the line's pretty much the same. You know, most of all I mean, we're generally using weight forward because it's quite a lot of there's a lot of wind we were playing with, and some like they um, on the Hardy. That's an ego um, an ego airflow ego lines. It's about 130 foot long with a 65 foot head. Would be right. Um, and so you can really, really send that a long way if, if you know what you're doing. Um, traces, most of the angling literature and in, in, uh, in talking about saltwater fishing will be talking about having a 10 kilo tipper, anywhere from sort of 2 metres to 3 metres long. But I'm actually a big fan of tapered traces, especially because we're on fishing, because I'm fishing in really shallow water, I'm fishing to fish that I can see, and presentation is actually quite important. So it's the sort of game you guys are playing all the time. So you, 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 I tend to like to use tape and traces, and I've got one of mine with me if you want to see what I do. And the other thing that's kind of that some people would use in the freshwater sense is a stripping basket, and that's one of the things you just have to carry on the flats because often you're in amongst oysters, mussels, and all sorts of crap that's going to rip your line to pieces. So you've got to keep it out of the water. So you, stripping basket's probably the one concession you've got to make. <coughs> There's me on the flats. You can see I'm, I'm, it looks like I'm going on a jihad because I've got all, all of the gear and probably no idea. But um, So I've got sun gloves, sun clava, hat, um, breathable fabrics, um, vest for my core. Um, and it's all about, to me, it's all about trying to look like I'm there. And then you'd be surprised, at, like I said before, how close you can get. So I'm talking a bit about clothing. Um, you, you might think that that, that um, on the right the shot there, that I'm not actually in tune with the background. But later on you see me, there's a photo of me actually fighting a trevally and you'd be surprised how good, how actual effective it is. But on that shot, it doesn't look like it. But everything you wear is, is the same sorts of things that you'd be out, that you'd be wearing when you're on a river. So you're looking for windproof, breathable. Um, I always carry waterproof layers. Um, if you can see here, I've got all my packs are all waterproof too, they can be submergible, so if it's going to be wet then I'll carry those. If it's if, if it's in the summer and it's not, then I'll just wear a vest pack or something like that. Um, but it's all about travelling light and carrying just the minimum amount of gear. Um, and it's all about wearing layers. I, I use a lot of vests, um, zip, zip front there, so you can just zip it open, let the heat out, dump the heat, and then if it gets cold you can pull it up again. Um, Definitely into all of the sun protection and the Polaroids are absolutely critical, just like on the river. Um, and I actually hate to say it for the guys that are selling gear here, but I actually just cheap breathable waders and cheap boots are fine. <coughs> because you know, if you don't really want to be wearing really expensive boots on the flats because they get absolutely munted, um, especially on the Manukau, because there's so many rock oysters and things around, it just they don't last five minutes, they get torn to bits. Um, and I'm also talking about here about camouflage patterns, I'm all into that. So these, this is all Sitka gear, and it's that Opti-Fade. Yep. Uh, with your Polaroids, what colour do you favour? Um, I've got two, um, so it depends on the light. So I'll use the green if it, or the darker colours if it's really bright, and then I'll go into yellows if it's quite quite dull. Okay, so ambers and then you yeah, can use yeah, exactly. rose or any of those. Yep, yep. So it's just the same as when you're on the you room. Just, but you remember that the intensity of sun on the flats is pretty severe, so you have to be wearing some sort of eye protection all the time. <coughs> so, where to look? I had to write Miola on there so I remembered where the reef was. But that, that's a um, Google Earth is a really good 
thing to look at. This is Miola Reef. A lot of people have saltwater fish, saltwater fly fish off Miola in Auckland. Um, but here I've, I've just taken a picture of this straight off a chart, a Manukau chart, and you can see that actually this is quite a good place to fish because you've got a deep hole at 11 metres, and it shells out to three, and then it, in those in the green bays there, they're actually um, it's quite sandy and it's quite shallow. And if you, if you look at that spot, which is near Titirangi, it is actually when you go there at low tide or high tide, it's actually quite epic. You know, there's some really nice rock structure there, some pretty big um, channel markers, and it's, it just screams kingfish. And there's a lot of mullet hanging off around it, so it's it's sort of a good good place to go. You caught but, kingfish? No, I haven't caught any kingfish there. No. Mm -hmm. No, they don't, man. <laughs> We've tried. Uh, it's one of our. It's one of our little challenges. Um, I should have said earlier on too. Sorry. Um, the images are in this are from three people. There's Paul. There's Mark Hoffman who's here. So some of those images before were for Mark. He's got a website called the Auckland Swaffer. Um, and Tim Angeli, who's also um, taken some of the other pictures you've seen. Who you've probably heard of. So what I'm looking for is I like to see deep channels near shallow areas and I like to see where channels are coming together. And I'm looking for reef structure and I'm looking for drop-offs or obvious ledges and I'm also looking for places where the channel narrows because especially when the tide's going out, if you're draining the flats and then you narrow the channel, it's, that's where the big fish like to hold because the water, water speed picks up and they sit, high, they sit deep. So, this, you heard me say before about snapper holes, if you walk onto the flats, you can pretty much see in the summer, and from now on, you walk along, you'll see where the snapper will be digging in the shells, and it looks like that. And if you, if you, find, if you walk in the flats and you find that, then you need to find the hole that's nearest to that, because dollars to donuts, they'll be holding in there. Um, the, I'm saying here the shallow areas with the deep channel I showed you. I also have... Um, I'm really big on birds, looking for what the birds are doing. So this is this is a royal spoonbill. On the manor cows, quite a few of them. They stand out like incandescent bulbs when the light's low. Um, they actually feed on mantis shrimps. So if you see if you see royal spoonbills in a bay, in a bay dotted, they're almost certainly feeding on little shrimps. So you have to, if you start to think about that, then that gives you a clue as to what flies you use. Um, same thing with um, gannets. Obviously, there's something's boiling the baits. The, the, the fish up and so they're coming in to hit them. Shags, also shags will congregate for the same reason. If, if um, the big predators are actually starting to co make the bait shoals coalesce, then the shags will be hanging around as well. So I'm always looking when I go onto the flats to see what the birds are doing, to see what birds are there. Um, I, I've a real big habit now of turning over rocks. So if you look on our website, we've got pit, you know little video clips of me turning over rocks just to show you how many crabs are there. Um, and on the Manukau, there's just, there can be thousands. You can turn over rock after rock after rock and they're just thousands of crabs. So it gives you a real idea of what I should be feeding, or what they'll be feeding on and what I need to use. Um, and I'm also, one of the things I talk about when I go onto the flats is training yourself to look for the unusual. Most people just go, in, go out there and they just go charging in. But you actually just have to take some time and try and see the things that are, that are happening on the flats that are actually a little bit different. And once you zone into that, you'll pick up all the action. Because there'll be little things that'll be happening. There'll be a little a cow oil coming and there'll be a little bait chair somewhere. And you just got to keep your, keep your eyes open for that stuff because it happens really quickly and you don't generally see it if you're not aware of it. Um, so you, I like to spend probably about 10 minutes when I first get there just to try and calm down see what's going on, see where the birds are, and try and f figure out what's happening on any particular day. So, at any particular time? At, at any particular Yeah, so, I mean, for me, I'm fishing the last two hours, if I'm fishing off a flat that's draining into a channel, I'm generally fishing the last two hours, over, especially in winter, but now as it's coming into summer, I almost always fish high tide, like when it's coming up to high because they're starting to move onto the, onto the flats to feed at that stage, whereas in, in the winter they'll tend to fish, the, the going out to low, to low tide is better. Um, I 
just said about the 10 minutes. Now, I said before about big snapper tailing in real close. We've seen that this year. We've seen kingfish coming in really, really close. We've got videos um, on the website where you've got kingfish that are within a rod and a half length from the shore that are just cruising in. They, they come out. It's quite interesting how they work because um, generally with a kingfish, it's low, they come in on a low light angle. So they force the little flounders up to the top and then they come in and hoover them up. And so they, they come almost out of the sun. So in the morning, when it, in the, if you're there on a, when it's starting to, the sun's starting to rise, and the light angle's low, they come right at you. And you'll see the big, v, the big V of the kingfish coming in close, and it's chasing something, and then it'll swirl and hit it, and then go out again. It's quite epic. Um, and you just about shit yourself when it happens, because sometimes it comes out of nowhere. Um, I was in the, on the Manukau, um, late summer and I was just minding my own business watching some yellow and mullet that were just mucking around in here and the next minute this probably about 1.2 metre kingfish just came and went right through the middle of them and, and turned and just showered me with water and pulled back out and you're like you, you just you just mesmerised it's just incredible and then I managed to get it to chase the fly about 10 casts later but I, I cocked it up and lost it so um, but it gives you an idea of how, how um, intense it can be um, backwater. I, I talk here about the there's a backwater analogy. You know when you're fishing, um, when you're going on a river and you're looking at back, you, you stalk onto a backwater and you're looking for cruising trout. It's kind of the same sort of thing. It's like you're looking for things that are cruising the flats, trying to hoover up the <coughs> And I always work the shallows before I move up, go into the water. I'm not a big wader. I don't like to wade too much. I just like to stay on the outside and try and work shallow water if I can. So one of my um, specialty events is moored boats. Um, not many people know or fish on estuaries near moored boats, but actually it's one of the places where the big fish congregate. And one of the reasons they do it is that um, a boat casts a shadow and, and the yachts that are in there are always going to have a keel. So they'll be in the deepest holes in the estuary for sure, otherwise they wouldn't be able to anchor there. And even a, um, a launch is going to have a fair, that's going to be in a, a, fair, a relatively deep part of the channel. But they cast a shadow, and if a big fish holes in a shadow, it can see twice as far out as things can see into the shadow. That's a fact. So they sit there and they wait, and that means that they've got much more chance, of fate. it's easier for them to hit anything that's coming past, because they see it, twice the distance before the other thing sees them. So they're halfway at it before they know what's coming. So it, moored boats is a real art form. So if the tide's going from left to right, then I'm trying to get right under the under the bow of the boat and let the fly line or the my soft plastic or whatever I'm using get right under the boat if I can. And you'd be surprised what's under there. You know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> But I don't tend to catch the boats very much because yeah. you know you soon get used to it and you don't even hit them very much now. <laughs> so I like I like high tide in the shallows at dawn. That's what I like because so I can. It's really there's nobody around and you can generally see, especially if there's no wind, you can see everything that's going on. If it's nice and mirror, mirror calm, you sit there, you'd be surprised at what you see. And I talked before about the low light angle, that's really important. So you've got to find a place um, where, the, where the, um, the kingfish especially are coming out of the sun. So you have to think about where the sun's rising and which, which bays and which parts of the, of the harbour and the rest, they will be working at a certain time of the day. Um, and I like the last two hours going out because so, it's concentrating everything. One of the things I talk about a lot is I, I'm really keen, on, especially in the Manukau, on excellent water clarity. If you can see into the water, then you stand a real chance of um, catching catching a lot more than if... Because essentially what happens is, if the water's clear, then the my theory is that the, the kawai and the trevally will actually feed on little fish, because they can see them, and they can, they, they can corral them, and they can work as a team to actually ha herd them up and harass them. If it's dirty, they can't. So, Nine times out of ten when you catch a fish, especially in the Manukau, and the water's clarity is piss poor, then nine times out of ten, 
if you open them up when you're catching them, you're feeding on crabs. Because when it's dirty, they look down and they feed it on the bottom on the things they can get. Um, especially if it's been you know, a period of bad weather for say a week, then they really are hungry and they're actually feeding off the bottom. But if it's just really hard to see stuff. And I also like the, the days when the temperature's rising quickly. Because the fish seem to be more active if the temperature's rising quickly and the water temperature is starting to lift. Whereas, you know, two degrees going up is much better than two degrees coming down. Two degrees coming down will put them off, and two degrees going up they'll come on to feed. Um, so just mentioned about the water is murky. Um, so I'll just reiterate that again. Is, so if it's dirty, I'll fish a crab or a shrimp pattern on the bottom. And if <coughs> I've got a, I've, in my fly box, wherever it is, um, I've got one of these things here which I call a brush ranger. Which basically all I've done is I've put a, a, um, a small amount of badger fur inside a piece of holographic tube and then tied it on and then I've got some more fur and some other bits and pieces there. And basically it can be, it's sort of, like a lot of the flies that I'm tying if you look at my box, they're what I call something and nothing type flies. They're not an exact imitation of a shrimp or a crab or whatever, but they might be. And if you're fishing in water that's kind of murky, then they get mistaken for all sorts of things. So they could think it's a shrimp, they might think it's a crab. It's kind of the right sort of shape and it's got the right sort of profile. Um, matching the lure colour to the light conditions. So if it's dark, then you want to use dark profiles. You guys are probably all familiar about this, but we've got a massive article on, um, on the website about lure, what, what lure colours you should be using and what light, <coughs> what light conditions. So you should really check it out. Um, the, fl the flats, I fish the flats all year round. So this year I fished about 50 days. So I haven't fished for the last two weekends, so um, I'm due to go out. But I'm generally I'm fishing about pretty much once a week, maybe more, um, and all the year round. So, um, And as I said before, Carlway and Trevally tend to dominate during the winter. One thing that um, Matt von Sturmer talks about, he's, he's got a salt fly fishing charter off um, Waiheke Island. One of the things he talks about is this do nothing retrieve. It's kind of the thing that you'd all be used to when you're wet lining. It's like cast it out, mend, just do nothing, just let it bounce along the bottom of the current, keep the line tight, mend, mend, and you'll be surprised what hits it when, it, when it's drifting around in that in, in normal arc. It's really similar to wet fly fishing, but doing bugger all. Um, and the last, the last slide I've got is, is what I call my, um, my secret weapon. Now I've, I've got here a, um, a Yamaga spin fishing rod. You're quite happy to, if anyone wants to have a look at it, you can. It's 9 foot 4. Um, I happen to get it from Rod and Reel. Um, it's just an awesome tool. It's kind of like a spinning rod that's a fly rod. But what I use them for is, more than anything else, is actually the second point there is as a depth sign on it depth sounder and a fish finder, because I haven't got any way of figuring out how deep the channel is, and often I can't do that with my fly rod, so I, I, go, I use my spinning rod to actually go long into the channel, let it sink, try and figure out what the bottom's like, see what I'm catching, how deep it is, and so that's how I prospect a new piece of water. I use my spinning rod a lot, and then once I've got my mind around it, I'll, I'll fish it based on what, what my mind's telling me the bottom's like. Um, so I use it also because some of the days when you're out there the wind will come up so you've got, you've got to counteract that and just use it for that and I'm, if I'm, I'm talking here about targeting fish that are further out and eliminating the need to, to wade but also gives me a chance if there's any kingfish around to bring them in with a pop-up without a hook on and then, then I have a chance. Um, but one of the things that is, is um, quite interesting to me is that last year I was fishing on the on the Manukau with Tim and Jilly, and we had a, one of those situations where the kawai were harassing bait into the shallows and they chased all the way around the bay into us and we caught a couple of kawai quite quickly and then everything went dead. It went dead for about 20 minutes and we're thinking, gee whiz, maybe they've gone, should we move somewhere else? Did it? And I said to Tim, oh, I just let me have a couple of casts with my spinning rod because I have a real feeling they're still here, but I just want to know where they are. And so three cars, caught two fish, got a real beef of where they were, and we sat there and we waited for five minutes later and they came back again. And it's like you just have to 
you know, you, after a while you get a real feel for where they are. And so you, and you, the spinning rod gives you the opportunity to, to actually just check your theories. Um, so I always will, if I don't get anything on a fly, then I'll go to my spinning rod and have a few casts and, and, and see what happens. And what so sort of spinners are you using? Um, should have Google those too. So, they're all in there. Got stick baits, got poppers, um, there's some soft baits. So, got jig heads in there. Um, these are all handmade, um, well, two of most of those are handmade stick baits. What weight of jig heads are you using? Generally, in uh, flats, I'll be using, I'd start with a quarter of an ounce. And I'd go lower, I'd go much smaller than that though, um, depending on what the current's doing. So at the start at the start of the session, if I'm fishing the last two hours down, I'd almost always start with a quarter. And um, but then as the tide starts to wane, I'll drop down in size. Um, but I, I'm not, and if a quarter's not going, it's not tapping along the bottom like I like it to, then I'll, I'll aim further upstream. And then mend, like I mend like mad with a soft bait rod. Spinning rod. Quarter ounce, yeah. Really smooth. Seven grams. So, I, and I use all sorts of things. I've got, you know, as you see when you're going around, there's, um, there's no, everything I use is in there, there's no. You go barbless? Um, generally, I, if, if I'm worried about that, I'll, bend it, I'll just bend it down. Um, the only reason I don't often is I'm catching car wire and they're often jumping and I'm not so big, I'm not so good at because If it's just a fly, then you can probably hold it on a barbless, barbless hook, but if you've got the weight of the jig head as well and you go barbless, then it's a little bit more difficult. Because when that fish gets airborne and starts shaking its head, there's a lot of weight at the front of that hook that's going to pull it right back out. So trying to keep it, especially you know, fighting it, it's trying more to often too. You're catching to eat, yeah, exactly. Not release. Yeah, well, no, I'm, I'm catching to release. Right, really? Yeah, so about 90, 95 percent of what I catch, I release. Okay. So I don't, I, um, yeah, I might keep the odd car wipe, but and I'll keep the odd trevally over the course of the year, but everything else goes back. Mm. So generally I'm fishing to, to release. Because that way I know that, especially in some of the places I fish, I've got a feeling that they're relatively fragile. Um, so I'm trying then to just conserve what stock there is so that I actually can go back the next week and catch it again. You know, that's how it goes through my head. So it's kind of like a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a saltwater fisherman and a, and a freshwater fisherman's body, if you like. I'm trying to, I'm trying to take all the principles that you hold and apply them in a different way. So the course of the day, like, like we go to, go to the river and maybe have a reach there and fish 200 yards, metres, and maybe something else. You're going to go out for the day, and we're talking about in the morning, at dawn there, you've got plans where you go and do well, that, no, and then I'll, I'll go to a rock area? No, no, I'll fish two hours, <laughs> two, two hours tops. Um, so I'll fish down to low tide and I go home. And um, it'll like, Often in those days it'll be all on, where you get lots of stuff, or it'll be, it'll be very little that'll happen. You might only get one or two fish in the session. But I, I just, when you're walking and, and moving in these sorts of areas, especially if I end up having to fish in the middle of the day, because that's when low tide is, mm. then I don't want to be on the flats for more than two hours. Mm. It's real, it's brutal stuff. Mm. But it's not so bad first thing in the morning. Yeah. But there's one place I fish it um, down on the Coromandel. It's quite interesting because normally you'd think um, fishing dawn is a good idea, but it's actually not there because it's but the sun rises behind a peninsula. It's not until it actually gets above the peninsula and starts to shine on the water that the fish start to move. So whilst you might be out there at 6:30, nothing will move until late. So you have to you have to understand what's going on in the particular place that you fish, and it takes time to build that knowledge up. But you guys, do you all have a diary, a fishing diary? Do you keep a diary? Yes, Because that's the first thing you've got to do if you go on the flats, is you're going to actually record everything. It's like, and you know, I know it sounds passe, and I think, oh, I've got to, the last thing I want to do is, is write all this down, but I actually write down um, everything that happens. So then, over the, now I've got something like uh, 
12 years with the data on a whole variety of spots, it tells me what to use when. Um, and you'll be, you'll be surprised how, how accurate it is. And I don't know whether it's just because you go back to the, old, the same things at the same time of the year or not, but it does seem to make a difference to me. So I like to just to write it all down. I don't nothing more than just say what the, um, the height of the tide was, the weather conditions, how clear the water was, what I used, what I caught. It's better. Not, not a hell of a lot of detail. And then in the middle of winter, sometimes if I'm busy, I'll just, or got nothing on, I'll just analyse it. Uh, yeah, I use all of that stuff. Yeah. Um, Wiggletail's really good on Trevally. And what was the question? Yeah. yeah. Um, the, Derek, what was your question? Yeah. Um, does yeah. he use the um, Mr. Twister Wiggletail? Oh, okay. Wiggletail. Okay. Soft. Fish. Yep, soft. Fish. Okay. Yep. But are you using those at all on your on your fly rod? Uh, no, not those? really. I use it on my spinning rod. But when you, if you have a look at it, you'll see it's got a fly rod. Yeah. It's a bloody long spinning rod for New Zealand. People don't don't use this. I mean, it's only 150 grams, but it's it's pretty epic. Good one. Okay. What other questions have we got? And the, this that was this approved tool. Okay. The commitment you've got to this whole thing is just wonderful. And especially when you get the commitment of a guy and he's writing down. When he goes fishing, just what the conditions are, and he really gets to know the water. And that's a lesson all of us can learn, I'm sure. That we go to the Tongariro and we fish a couple of days and come back again. We go back again and we say, oh, hell, what did we do last time? To write them down and to do it properly is certainly a commitment on that. That's great. Now, what other questions have I got for, for um, I got one. Yep. I mean, on a river or dry fly aside, we try to get weight on it and get down to the bottom, even with a dry line. So how do you know you use a wet line or dry line or? Well, most of the time I'm fishing in water. On species? Yeah, it, it does a bit, but most of the time I'm fishing with um, in water that's probably about six to ten foot deep, probably tops. Okay. So you pretty much can get down to the bottom with an ordinary fly rod and a long trace and a, a weighted fly like Stephen's been tying here. A floating line. Yeah, floating line. Yeah. Okay. I, I, I know Mark, you, you use quite a wet line quite a lot, don't you? So we kind of like when we're fishing together. Then Mark will be using a wet line. I'll be using a dry line. And if, if it works for him, I'll just change the spool. Mm -hmm. You know, I've got all that stuff with me. So okay, you're sinking traces. Wet, sorry, if you're using a wet line. You don't need to have a fast sinker. I guess you just no nah, slow, easy. slow, slow. Intermediates are what they use. But you can do. You can hinge it on too. Like you could just if you if you only had your fly uh, your floating fly line with you, you can also put a poly leader on to drop it off because it's not very deep. So you can take it down that way as well. Yeah, head droppers and well, I've never done that, but it's possible. I mean, it's entirely possible. The only trouble is in the sea. If you hook two, <laughs> then it's 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 going to be pretty epic. It's going to be quite short too. So what what did you say earlier that your trace weights were for general? Um, generally, I'm fishing at about five, I'd be about seven kilos okay. at tipper. Yeah, yeah it's fifteen. It's a hard thing to get your mind around, but they, that doesn't seem to be a problem. Because you never know what's going to take it. Um, yeah, that's, that's the difference between the, the, the freshwater and the salt. And in, in the freshwater, you know it's going to be a trout, and you've only got a basic idea of how big it is. And you basically would vary the trace weight depending on how fast the water was and how gnarly the conditions were, I guess. The same sort of thing in the sea, but you never really know what's going to hit it. And, and of course, you know, a, a, a car like going at speed is uh, going to be even a greater threat to your gear than, than a good trap on the top of the river. the only A boost? No. What sort of other species do you find out there besides you? Well, the big four are the ones that I've got um, that I've mentioned, but I do, I have caught um, small yellow eyed mullet, Karori, I've even got a Gurnard in a estuary and on the Coromandel, a tiny one. Um, <coughs> I've seen them, but I haven't caught, I haven't caught them, no. Uh, but they're there. A lot, often, in, often in the places I'm fishing, it can be quite turbulent, so it's actually, you know, they would be there probably at high tide rather than low, and I'm pushing down to low. Um, so uh, the only time you would probably see them is if the current you know, like was a low, a low, um, high low tide, where there was not much current moving between high and low. 
What about Flounder? Is he a fish tribe? No, but Craig Worthington's into that, eh? Yeah, I mean, no, I've read yeah. some things about guys. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so in the, I think it was in, um, in the magazine Fly Life in the last issue, there's an article by Craig Worthington on, on fishing for Flounder and, okay. and up north. And that's also, that's something I'm really, really keen to do. Good one.